As any good story will show, real villains are as human as you or I. Even with all their vices and evils, they're still uncomfortably relatable. And it's that likeness to us, everyday people, that makes them frightening. Silco is a ruthless authoritarian who weaponizes the weak to further his goals. He holds onto power at any cost, and there's no level too low for him to stoop if it means he can win. Except in regards to his one weak link, a vulnerability as old as time. The love he holds for his one and only child. Hello, my name is Liddy, and welcome to Shaped by Stories, where we discuss how and why our favorite stories shape our own. Let's get into it. Like most kids in the Undercity, Silco had to grow up quickly, and he did so alongside Vander, a fellow Zonite that he considered a brother. Between Vander's brawn and Silco's cleverness, the two survived the squalor of the Undercity, and as they grew, so did their dream, the Nation of Zon, an Undercity free of Piltover's control. But Silco, somewhere down the revolutionary line, did something that Vander did not like. Tensions rose to the point where Vander tried to murder Silco by drowning him in the polluted waters of Zaun. Silco nearly gave in, no physical match for Vander, until the urge to fight, to survive, seized him. He grabbed Vander's knife, taking control back from the man who had only just been choking the life from him. Due to an eye injury from this fight, and his being submerged in the polluted waters of Zaun, his eye mutated after his escape. And as the bitterness of this betrayal festered within Silco, so did the poison of oppression seep into his flesh. Silco decided that he would free Zaun himself, on his terms. And he would have his ultimate revenge. Over the next few years, Silco worked with Singed on the creation and distribution of Shimmer, biding his time. His plan, as he later tells Vander, was to beat Piltover at their own game, turning their own corruption against them. While Vander continued to protect the weak when he could, Silco was already exploiting them for his own gain, for Vander, power was earned through acts of courage, of showcasing his great strength. Vander was charismatic, a wolf of a man. You can understand why people followed him in his failed rebellion. But for Silco, someone who lacked all of these things, power wasn't about how strong you were, or how fast, or how intelligent. He couldn't afford to pigeonhole himself into any one of those categories. Silco decided that power was about how much you were willing to give to take it. But by the beginning of Arcane's main story, Vander's reign is dying. Silco's is on the rise. He still has a fighting spirit, and he can't understand where Vander's went. Silco is a master at noticing insecurities and fears and weaknesses in his targets. This is how he gets a hold of Marcus, manipulating this young, bullheaded enforcer into helping him get revenge on Vander and essentially taking control of the Undercity, all while leaving Marcus completely oblivious to this and also making him feel like he's in charge. In reality, Silco hates enforcers. To him, they are a symbol of oppression. Silco perverts the bond of trust that Grayson and Vander share through his manipulation of Marcus, an added twist of the knife, I think, towards his former brother. After the death of Grayson and the successful kidnapping of Vander, Silco drops a bag of literal blood money for his new Judas. He's hooked and sunk Marcus so quickly. It's interesting that Vander, the Hound of the Underground is less predatory in his practices than Silco. So Vander gets dragged back to Silco's lair, and Silco tries to get him to join him. 
Rather than this simply being strategic, I think this is Silco seeking validation from Vander. Yes, Silco's wanted revenge on Vander for that betrayal all those years ago. But the other side of this kidnapping, I think, is Silco really wanting Vander to admit that he was wrong. I think Silco once looked up to Vander like Powder to Vi. I also believe Vander was a sort of protector to Silco. I think much like Powder, Silco craved to have that old bond back in his life. Even though Silco is the one in control in this situation, I think it really bothers him that he can't control Vander here. Vander might express guilt and regret over his betrayal, but he will not tell Silco that he was right. He will not tell Silco that he was strong enough, or fast enough, or smart enough. In Vander's mind, Silco is still wrong. Vander can't abide by flooding the lanes with Shimmer, with ruling over the people of Zaun, people that he has always wanted to protect, with an iron fist. Vander tells Silco to kill him, if he has to, but to spare the lanes. Silco, at this point, doesn't understand where Vander's sense of fight went. He doesn't understand that his love for his children has replaced his desire to destroy. You'll die for a cause but won't fight for one is a statement Silco will fully comprehend someday, but he can't right now. Silco solely wants to destroy what he hates. He has so much bitterness in him, he cannot understand Vander's desire to protect what he loves. After torturing Vander, Silco is still bitter and hateful, so much so that he's willing to kill Vander's kids, or at least harm them. But it's interesting to see how Vi, already, is a bit of a threat to Silco's hold on things, something that really comes to fruition in Act 2. Savika shields Silco from Powder's Hextech Blast throwing herself in harm's way, and losing her arm in the process. An act that would later lead to Savika becoming his iron fist throughout Zaun. Afterwards, Vander makes a last stand, and nearly kills Silco in an attempt to protect Vi, his last remaining daughter. But Silco, using the knife he stole from Vander all those years ago, stabs his former brother showing just how long he held onto the pain of that day. But it's here that Vander meets his own breaking point, and, as he lays dying, ingests Shimmer. Silco's grand creation turns his former brother into the monster that Silco long saw within him, shrinking Silco down even more in contrast to this massive, mutated beast of a man. Not all that dissimilar from Powder's final encounter with Vi, where Vi went from protector to monster, in the eyes of the person who once depended on them most. Silco later finds Powder, sobbing next to the body of his former brother. Silco has that blade still clutched in his hand, but Powder only sees a person who asked her if she was okay, the first and only person to do so as she struggles to handle what she perceives as a betrayal. Powder literally leaps at this comfort, disarming Silco, sending the knife, that symbol of his hatred, off to the side. When Powder cries about Vi's abandonment of her, her own sister, Silco sees a kindred spirit, and he genuinely holds this little girl in his arms, comforting her and promising her we will show them all. A promise that, in the end, is kept. Years pass, and Silco rules Zaun from the shadows. His dream of a new day is closer than ever, though progress isn't quite as quick as he'd like. But Silco is all about a long game, He's patient, and biding his time is something he's used to. But at this point, Silco is not just a devilish villain, he's not just an authoritarian ruler. He is also a devoted father, 
Under his wing, powder grew into Jinx, a young woman who was a far cry from that sobbing little girl. But instead of trying to help Powder grieve and process her own emotions in a healthier way than he did, Silco passed down his bitterness. Jinx became a genius with a knack for all things mechanical, but with deep instability and homicidal tendencies. Jinx, much like Powder, was a known screw-up. Nobody really liked her and she wasn't exactly kind either. But Silco loved Jinx for all her scars. For to him, they were what made her. Largely because he encouraged them to fester, just as his did. Silco gave Jinx a little hideout, with all the space she needed to invent her weapons. He let her hang out in his office, hiding in the ceiling and drawing all over the walls. His desk is littered with little mementos that Jinx gives him. Silco trusted her so much that he let her administer his medication. Silco needed Shimmer injected in his eye to contain its affliction. We see him start the series more able to administer this himself, and with less pain. And I see this as how easy sacrificing for Zahn is for Silco. But as time passes, he finds this increasingly difficult to do. Having Jinx there to give him his medicine instead not only shows his immense trust in her, but it also shows that his work is taking a toll. His infection is spreading. But despite it all, Jinx is something he's proud of. Silco gives Jinx jobs to do with his syndicate, wanting to blend the two most important things in his life. That way, he wouldn't have to choose between Zahn and Jinx, or at least that's how I see it. But this often doesn't go smoothly, and Savika, Silco's second, is often left to clean up the messes the impulsive Jinx leaves behind. After Jinx screws up on a shimmer run, Savika tells Silco that Jinx is a liability, but Silco won't hear any of it. He knows if Savika left him, he'd be set back immensely, but he cares enough about Jinx that he risks that. Savika left Vander largely for this same weakness, and she can see it starting to happen again. But Silco still has enough of his passion for his dream that Savika still views him as Zahn's best hope. This is why she continues to work for him, even if Silco dismisses most of what Savika says about his daughter. While Silco is honest with Jinx about her screw-up here, he still shields her from the consequences and valid criticism. Yes, he tells her that she's set back their plans for weeks, but he basically gives her a slap of the hand, while Savika has to deal with most of the trouble. Much like Vi, Silco is still overprotective of Jinx, and I think it is in part because to be critical of Jinx is to be critical of himself. He loves Jinx, but I think that love is largely due to the perfection that he molded within her. When Jinx blows up enforcers and buildings in Piltover, Silco does get mad at her. This is a huge mess he will have to clean up, but he's cut short the moment Jinx, for once serious, pulls out a Hextech gem, a key tool to Piltover's dominion over Zaun. Perhaps with it, Zaun will be able to meet Piltover on a technological level. Jinx hugs her father, and we see in this shot the true and ultimate dilemma of Silco's story. In one hand, he holds the key to Zahn, and in the other, his most precious work. And we already know, just by how close Silco holds her, who will win out in the end. Silco trusts Jinx to reverse engineer Hextech. If she cracks it, they'll have a weapon to boast against Piltover. Finally, some leverage in a fight that's been dragging its heels. But after Jinx comes to a standstill due to the ghosts of her past, Jinx comes running to him for comfort once again, and tells him she doesn't want to work on Hextech again. It's too painful. But Silco tells her, Fear haunts us all, child. 
I think a really important aspect of Silco's character is his desire for control. Silco's never been a fighter or a genius. He's not even an upfront politician, technically. He's more of a hidden figure. His sole power is controlling everything around him from his dingy office. And I'm sure growing up in Zaun was a long lesson in how crappy it feels to have no control over your own life. But another thing to note is that Vander's attempted murder of him was through asphyxiation. I'd argue the most helpless way to die. But rather than let his fear control him in that situation, he instead fought back against it. He wrestled his life back just when he thought all was lost. Fear may still haunt him, but it does not control him. At least, not often. Silco believes that for Jinx to take control of her own life, to stop feeling like her past is holding her prisoner, she must let her old self die, her fearful self. She must retake control from the past. Silco takes her to the river where Vander tried to kill him all those years ago, where he took control. He tells her he let a weak man die in order to become what he is today. And while I do believe that Silco is stronger, sure, I think his old self is absolutely not dead. And I think this is best shown in his fear of losing Jinx. Silco, after all of what he went through with Vander, had his ability to trust and his ability to care basically ripped apart. Jinx changed that because in her, he saw himself. Jinx, therein, filled that void in his heart, as screwed up as they both are and she is really precious to him in that sense. For Jinx's past to wrestle her away from him would be heartbreaking. And so, killing Powder was necessary for Silco to maintain control over Jinx being in his life. It's definitely selfish on his part, but I do think he also wants to give her peace. He doesn't like to see her in pain. Again, Silco does love Jinx, but he's also super screwed up and she's screwed up, so it's not like a pure love, it's toxic. For a while, this little dunk in the water does bring some stability to Jinx's life, and also to Silco's, but it doesn't last long. Because after years of believing she was dead, Silco finds out that Vi has returned. The only agent of chaos he wants is Jinx. The chaos he nurtured. Not the chaos Vi represents. The chaos of that one man he couldn't truly control. Silco launches a full-blown manhunt to get Vi under control. Vi and Caitlin were hiding out in Vi's childhood home, one she shared with Powder in their earliest years. This home, or what remains of it, sits in a pit, deep in the bowels of Zaun, where the fallen reside. Shimmer addicts, the maimed, the mutated, reside in the darkness. Desperate for even a drop of the drug that ruined their lives. Silco is known as the Eye of Zaun, and we see a great big neon eye glowing on top of the tower that makes up the structure of Vi and Powder's home. This corruption, heavy upon the world these sisters once knew. Where they both wish they could return to. Silco corners Vi here after using an army of addicts to help find her. People who once admired Vander are now slaves to the sludge that Silco has peddled. As Huck explains to Caitlin, he did shimmer because he just wanted to feel strong. I think Silco understands this well, how it felt to be weak. He knows how powerful it is, what shimmer can provide, and he exploits that. Silco had that moment where he snapped and decided to fight and take with all his might. He was never offered the same quick fix, never peddled the same lie or half-truth that he peddles to other vulnerable people. 
to Silco. Those who don't have that same kind of moment as him are weak. He's obviously stronger, so why shouldn't he take advantage of them? It's all for a greater cause, right? In contrast, Vi stands not with an army of the oppressed. Rather, she stands with one person who wishes to annihilate all oppression in Zon. Caitlyn is an enforcer working with a Zonite, fostering mutual trust and loyalty. Their very partnership goes against what Silco believes. It's interesting how Silco would look at Caitlyn and classify her as one of the oppressors, when she, not Silco, right in that moment, is helping the weaker party, Vi. Not only that, she shows kindness to Huck. All while Silco stands with an army of people enslaved by a poison he peddled, fully aware of what it does. If he has to stand on a mountain of bodies to make Zaun the free nation he wants it to be, that's a price he's willing to pay. <laughs> but you know, Silco's doing what he said to Vander that he would do. He would beat Piltover at their own game. He would be just as corrupt as them. He really isn't that different from Piltover becoming the same sort of monster. But unlike Vander having his epiphany on the Bridge of Progress, Silco hasn't yet had his realization of what this tactic will leave him with. Not until he too stands upon that very same bridge. Vi and Caitlin bring down the tower, crashing Silco's eye around him. After they escape, Silco rages, stomping around the ruins of his very corruption. Vi is here, and she's prepared to bring it all down if it means she can get her sister back. This is the first time, of two, where we see Silco just lose it, because he doesn't have the control here. Losing control is very scary for him. He gets violent and he gets sloppy. Silco even attempts to go talk to Jinx, just wanting to get her finding out about Vi under control when Savika stops him. One thing Silco's consistently done with Savika when it comes to Jinx is that he's often brushed off the real reason why he won't accept her criticisms of Jinx. He will always brush it aside, blame Jinx's issues on others, and never fully admit that Jinx is his weakness. Savika advising him, despite her own issues with Jinx, says, for one thing, that the two are friends of a sort, after working together after all these years, Silco taking her advice says a lot about how much he respects Savika, but it also shows how much he cares about Jinx. His acknowledging that Savika is right by listening to her is his way of admitting, yes, Jinx is my weak link, and he has to come up with a way to show that he still cares about Zahn more than anything, Savika can still rely on him. He has to show that he is not compromised. Silco and Savika go to meet the Chem Barons at the meeting they called about the blockade. A blockade that Silco is not even certain he's in charge of, as Savika reminds him. Nobody really knows what Marcus's allegiances are at this point, and Silco's trying to delude himself into sounding like he's certain that Marcus is on his side, but it's... Uh, it's not a good time for him. Silco gasses the meeting, basically asphyxiating them all to near death with the toxic chemicals Zonites are exposed to. Gases that Silco is used to. Silco is showing, with quite a bit of theater, that he lives and breathes Zon. Unlike the Chem Barons, he never left the Undercity. He chose to stay and sit in the pollution, that would remind him why he's fighting in the first place. He calls out the Chem Barons for having the luxury to forget what they're supposed to be fighting for, becoming so accustomed to the cushy lifestyle their wealth, wealth he's enabled, has afforded them. I also like that he's employing asphyxiation as a way to gain control over the Chem Barons. Silco breathes and makes a speech through this air, while those who dare to criticize him suffocate around him. And this is why Savika ultimately stays loyal to him, after Finn tries to tempt her betrayal. He's still got it, 
and he's far more cunning and capable a leader than Finn could ever be. Savik is not above switching sides, if someone better for Zahn came along. But Silco, for now, walks the walk and talks the talk, even as his empire is on uneasy footing. But Savika still warns Silco here. He needs to decide what he's loyal to, Jinx or Zahn, before someone better comes knocking. And I think Silco deeply respects Savika's honesty here. He knows that she's loyal only to Zahn, and I think if he was in her shoes, he'd say the same thing. Her ability to think for herself and know her own mind is what makes her invaluable as his truest enforcer. Jinx eventually does go to confront Silco about Vi, but she's violent and she feels betrayed. She believes that Silco lied to her about Vi still being alive. Rather than trying to calm the situation, Silco uses Jinx's own insecurities to fuel her belief that Vi has replaced her. Silco can see how much Vi means to her, just by how angry Jinx is at the idea of Vi being hidden from her. Silco fears Vi retaking her old position as the most important person in Jinx's life. Silco has been abandoned before, and he cannot have that happen again. But I also think that Silco still clings to this idea that Vi and Powder had a similar betrayal to him and Vander. I think that thought has been a comfort to him, because it meant, in his mind, he was doing everything right with Jinx. For it to be coming out that the event was not at all what it seemed, would call into doubt some of Silco's choices, both with himself and Vander, and his own daughter. Silco is fighting this reunion of these two sisters with all his power, but it's ironically a reunion he conspired to have with his own brother not so long ago. Perhaps he doesn't want Jinx to feel the same pain of rejection that he felt after failing to get Vander to join him. Or maybe it's his way of avoiding the pain of admitting how different things could have been if only he'd done some things differently. Because, for all he knows, maybe Vi and Powder could have a different outcome. He feels out of control here. But the final nail in the coffin of getting Jinx to simmer down and listen to his words is when he tells her he needs her. Now more than ever. She needs to finish the Hextech weapon. He trusts nobody else but her to do this. And so Jinx goes to get the crystal, plunging Silco into a crisis that had been brewing for years, all based on his realization of what his fight has wrought him. His daughter nearly dying on the bridge of progress. Silco finds Jinx on the bridge of progress, terribly injured, near death, but still clutching the Hextech crystal. The crystal she lost and had to go and get, that I also don't think Silco realized that had been stolen in the first place. I think Silco is now realizing that maybe his plans put her in fatal danger. Silco knows what Shimmer does, but he still subjects her body to the treatment. You could definitely look at how tender Silco is with her, and how he cradles her in his arms, as a sign of how genuine he is with his love for her. But I still think this act is quite selfish. His choice to put Jinx through this traumatic experience that warps her mind creates a new kind of monster. When Jinx wakes up, she goes on a semi-rampage, kidnapping Caitlyn and Vi and then Silco, but only because she thinks he's going to betray her. Silco managed to broker the beginnings of a very shaky peace deal with Jace, the most naive and easily manipulated member of the council, so who knows if this would have actually 
you know, worked. The deal is that Zahn gets to have more autonomy. Silka would have been on the council. Zahn would have been more than just a slum. There was all these nice promises. But the thing that stops Silco in his tracks here, that bars him from feeling like he's finally got the victory he's been looking for all these years, is the fact that Jace wants Jinx. And so Silco goes to the statue of Vander. All these years later, he still wishes Vander's guidance, that reassurance. We see Vi has the same sort of moment with her dream of Vander in the bar. Honestly, sometimes I think that Vi and her closeness to Vander made Silco feel like Vi was maybe a replacement for him. Silco and Vi are very similar in many ways. It's really interesting, like both in how they view Powder slash Jinx, and also how important Vander's memory is to them, for good or for ill. Sitting at Vander's feet, Silco says, Is there anything so undoing as a daughter? Finally understanding why Vander lost his desire to fight for Zahn. Because now, Silco has come full circle himself. He understands. And to an extent, while Silco might not forgive his brother, understanding is a powerful thing. He pours some liquor in the fountain, almost like a reconciliation. But Jinx hears this conversation and mistakes it for him planning on handing her over. And so she kidnaps him, making Silco one of her special guests at her tea party. Oh boy. Jinx has Silco bound and gagged. He's sitting across from Vi, and he's helpless to plead his case when Jinx tells Vi she has to choose. Powder or Jinx. Vi tries to reason with Powder, who she refuses to refer to as Jinx, saying that they can just leave the city together entirely. Silco, once ungagged, argues that Vi wouldn't last two days with Jinx. He refuses to acknowledge Powder. Vi would realize that Powder isn't the same little girl anymore, and I don't think he's really wrong about this. I, th I think it would happen. But he's desperate to stop the deconstruction of this perfect daughter that he's molded over the years. Jinx places her pistol next to Silco, and I do think that it is Jinx that's doing that. I think a part of Jinx does want Silco to just kill her past for her, but Powder doesn't, so she leaves Silco tied up. When Vi starts calling out to Powder and stirring up all her monstrous memories of the past, for all of Silco's faults, he does understand that this is tormenting Jinx. Completely out of control, he tries to scream at Vi to stop, wriggling out of his bonds and about to shoot when Powder kills him to protect her sister. Jinx is heartbroken and terrified, and scrambles over to Silco as he dies. He tells her, and I believe he's being sincere, that he never would have given Jinx to Piltover. Not for anything. His final words to her, the don't cry, you're perfect, are some of the most important words Silco's ever said to Jinx. Considering how everybody else thought she was a screw-up, it's a big thing for him to say this, even in the face of the death she caused. Silco doesn't hate her, he still loves her unconditionally, and he doesn't blame her for anything. Silco showed them all in the end, that he was the one person who, in the face of absolute disaster, could still show his love to the person who caused it. However, I do think that, yes, Silco loved Jinx, but he only saw her as perfect because he molded her in her very vulnerable years to the idea of perfection he wanted. Of course she's perfect to him. This isn't Silco saying, you're perfect, no matter what, this is Silco saying, you're perfect, just the way I made you. Again, this is about control. 
For Silco, that's all it was ever about. And with his dying words, he exercises a powerful form of control over his daughter, over the situation, with these very important words. But we won't know the full extent or the full effect of these words until season two. Thank you very much for watching this one, guys. Silco is great. Like, the way they've balanced his evils with the more relatable aspects of who he is and what he does is incredible. I'm really wondering how they're gonna write, like, next season's villain, which I- is that- is it gonna be Ambessa? I don't know! I don't know! Whoever it is, I'm really curious to see how they contrast with Silco, if the contrast storyline hints are to be indeed true. Oh, thank you very much to my members. You guys are awesome. You can see Mika's name. Mika is the special member of the video because she's my sister and she also makes my thumbnails, which many people were saying they liked the thumbnails, and that's my sister. Thank you so, so much for watching. Let me know what you think of Silco in the comments below, and I will see you again in the next one. Have a good day, guys. Goodbye!